You are listening to Lighthearted, the official podcast of the United States Lighthouse Society. My name is Jeremy Dontremont. Welcome. My co-host today is Cindy Johnson, award-winning volunteer for Friends of Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouses and copy editor for the U.S. Lighthouse Society. Hi, Cindy. Hi, Jeremy. Today is June 12th, 2022, and this is episode 177 of Lighthearted. In a few minutes, we'll hear a conversation with four people at Marquette Harbor Lighthouse in Michigan. I recorded it when I was there just a few weeks ago. First, has anything interesting happened on this date in Lighthouse history, Cindy? Yes, as a matter of fact. On June 12th, 1898, a small sailboat washed ashore at Osable Point on Michigan's Upper Peninsula. The incident sparked one of the best-known lighthouse mysteries on the Great Lakes. In the wrecked sailboat was the body of assistant keeper Edward Morrison from the Grand Island North Lighthouse, and it was apparent that he had been murdered. Investigators found that the lighthouse had been deserted and the principal keeper, George Jennery, was missing. Jennery was never found, and the station's second boat was also missing. Investigators developed two theories. The first, Jennery murdered assistant keeper Morrison for unknown reasons, placed the body in the boat, and pushed it into the lake, and then fled in the remaining boat. The second theory was that both keepers, recently paid, were robbed and murdered by unknown assailants. The mystery remains unsolved to this day. I know true crime podcasts are very popular. I think those mm-hmm. are about the most popular podcasts out there. So maybe we should concentrate more on these kinds of stories. What do you think, Sydney? Well, sort of morbid, but definitely <laughs> interesting. Yeah. Well, there's plenty of lighthouse mysteries out there. Absolutely. Uh, you know, all kinds of uh, bizarre and, and yeah. morbid <laughs> things have happened with lighthouses right. over the years. So not to not to joke about it. There really are oh. some interesting stories, and we'll we'll, well talk right. about them. And it's, it's part of their history. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And lighthouse keeping wasn't as romantic as people think. I'll just throw that in there, no, too. It's, definitely not. There are all kinds of dangers. So, Cindy, please help me tell our listeners about Marquette Harbor Lighthouse and today's guests. Sure, Jeremy. The city of Marquette, Michigan, is a major port on Lake Superior, known primarily for the shipping of iron ore. In the mid-1800s, Marquette was linked by railroad to numerous mines, and it became the leading shipping port of Michigan's Upper Peninsula. It also became a popular summer destination, with steamships bringing passengers who filled the city's hotels and resorts. Marquette's first lighthouse, a stone tower built in 1853, was poorly built and had to be replaced in 1866 by the structure that still stands today. It's a one and a half story brick building with an attached 40 foot tall lighthouse tower. Around 1910, a second story was added to the house to provide additional living space for an assistant keeper. After automation, the Coast Guard continued to use the keeper's quarters for housing for some years. In 2002, the Coast Guard leased the building to the Marquette Maritime Museum. In 2016, ownership was conveyed to the city of Marquette. I visited Marquette Harbor Lighthouse and the Marquette Maritime Museum during my visit to Michigan in late April, just a few weeks ago. It was cold and windy and snowy. There were people surfing on the big waves near the lighthouse on Lake Superior, something I was kind of surprised to to see. I didn't ever think about people surfing on the Great Lakes, (laughs) but at least on Lake Superior they do. But in spite of the cold and wind and snow, I, I really enjoyed visiting there. Four people took part in the conversation we're about to hear. Frederick Stonehouse has authored over 30 books on maritime history, many of them focusing on the Great Lakes, and he's also president of the Marquette Maritime Museum. Hilary Billman is the director of the Marquette Maritime Museum. Kurt Fosberg is a professional lampist and also vice president of the Maritime Museum. The fourth person taking part in the conversation is my good friend Nick Korstad, who served as my host and tour guide for my week in Michigan in April. I stayed at his uh, Big Bay Point Lighthouse B&B during most of that trip. Nick and I had an excellent visit in Marquette, so let's listen to that conversation now. I'm here at the Marquette uh, Maritime Museum, which is next door to the Marquette uh, Harbor Lighthouse here in Marquette, Michigan, and I'm here with Hillary Billman, the museum director, and Frederick Stonehouse, president of the board of the Marquette Maritime Museum, and former mayor of Marquette, among other things, and of course, author of a 
zillion books about uh, local history and shipwrecks and so forth, and I hope we can talk a little bit about that as well. And also with us is Kurt Fosberg, who is the vice president of the Maritime Museum, and also uh, well known as a lampist. He's done uh, Fresnel Lens uh, related work all over the country, and I last saw Kurt in uh, East Providence, Rhode Island, in the fall. Bottom rocks. Yeah, when you did uh, the uh, moving and cleaning and installation in a museum of a fourth order Fresnel lens at Bottom Rocks. That was a, a lot of fun to be part of that, to uh, did a little video on that. So good to see you again. It's good to see you all. And also with me uh, is, uh, is Nick Korstad, uh, owner of Big Bay Point Lighthouse. Uh, who is acting as my host for this week in uh, this beautiful part of the country. So thank you, Nick. Thank you all. All right. So first of all, let's start with, uh, with you, Hillary, if we could. Uh, how did you, uh, what brought you here? We were just talking a few minutes ago. You said museum director for six years now, is that yeah, correct? Yeah, this will be my sixth summer at the museum. And mm -hmm. I was formerly a museum director at a small historical museum in uh, Wyoming. Um, I worked there for seven years. I don't think Kurt knew that. Well, He's making a face like he Wyoming. didn't know that. Not a maritime museum in Wyoming. <laughs> no, no. It was uh, bootlegging and prostitution. So, oh, wow. Yeah, so um, just a coal mining town in uh, Wyoming. So I moved here nine years ago with my husband and children. My husband's a professor at Northern Michigan University. Mm -hmm. So, um, And the museum was looking for a director, and I was looking for a job, so I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. Yeah, well, that's what life is all about, putting yourself in the, the right right place, uh, and it seems, like you, it seems like a perfect fit, as far as I can tell. Yeah, yeah, I really like my job. That's great. So let's talk a bit about the, the history of the lighthouse, and I'm going to start with a, a question that I'm sure you could probably get asked about as, as much as any question, other than where are the restrooms in the museum. Uh, why is the lighthouse red? Red's been elected. I, I've been elected, and it's a sorry tale, I think, of woe, but uh, the original lighthouse, of course, was constructed with Cream City brick from Milwaukee, which was a yellow first floor. The second floor was added about 1910, and that was added of local brick. So the Coast Guard, uh, for reasons known but to the grace of God, determined in the 1950s that all navigation devices right hand outside of harbor entering would be painted red. And since that lighthouse is on the right-hand side of Marquette Harbor entering, it was duly painted red, as was Big Bay, or rather uh, the uh, Big Red down in Lake right. Michigan, Holland, and yeah. Holland, Michigan, and Surgeon Bay's, uh, Surgeon Bay, Wisconsin, and Lake Michigan also had the same thing with the entrance light becoming red from its original coloration. Okay. And you've had it uh, painted properly more recently, right? Well, more recently, about five years ago, uh, when we were doing official turnover between the Coast Guard owning the property and the city of Marquette that in turn received the property as, as the custodian of the historic Lighthouse Park area, right? Uh, we uh, were able to have it painted to the original specifications as deemed necessary by State Historic Preservation Office. And it, uh, it, it gleams pretty good. It's a, it's a good, sharp-looking lighthouse. It's very mm -hmm. uh, yeah. memorable, certainly for folks that have an opportunity for the first time to see it. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure it surprises a lot of people who don't know a whole lot about lighthouses who expect a tall tower or something. It's unique. It is unique because of the way it was constructed, originally mm -hmm. starting with one floor and moving to two floors, adding it out then for, not any more vertically, but now you're, you're moving it uh, horizontally for mm -hmm. about uh, 50 feet or so. Uh, you're adding a different structure around the perimeter of the lighthouse. You're changing the entrance ways. So over time, it had certainly adapted to different uses and different purposes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. What about the human history of the place? Are there any particular interesting stories of life of keepers and families here? One of the stories that we like to tell on our tours um, that I think is a great story is Eliza Truckee, who was a lighthouse keeper from 1862 to 1865 while her husband was fighting in the Civil War. Mm. And so she was in the original lighthouse, which was um, a stone and wood tower structure and then a separate living quarters. And she had four children under the age of 10, mm -hmm. and she did all the duties of a lighthouse keeper, but she was not officially recognized as a lighthouse keeper because she was a woman. So yeah, so that's a great story about Eliza Truckee that we like to tell. What about life here uh, in the uh, 19th century? It was, it was this, uh, how isolated was this? Well, Marquette was uh, founded in 1849, and it was founded because of the very rich deposits of iron ore that were yeah. located just to the west of the city. And when we think about the Industrial Revolution, 
and we think about being the arsenal of democracy for different wars and construction activity, it all began right here because without those, those terrific deposits of iron readily available in the county, this nation would not have developed in the way it did, particularly during the Civil War when we were shipping the bulk of the product used by the Union armies to defeat the South. Mm -hmm. was coming right out of Marquette, yeah. which meant the city was a growth industry in terms of not only handling iron ore, but general shipping and freight shipping and uh, also lumbering activity, commercial fishing. So we would be a town of about ten or 12,000 people, mm -hmm. which was a very large community for the, the original shipping port on Lake Superior. And this would continue up until uh, really the present day. I'm glad you made those points. It's pretty important. But, you know, let me make yeah. one little twist to that. Yeah. Well, the lighthouse and uh, some of the things in town, like the iron ore docks, are very reminiscent of that industrial pass. Mm -hmm. the, f the city has flipped now to more of a recreation, information-driven future. And we were just named one of the top 100 cities in the country for remote workers, oh. which means we're getting more and more folks from around the world that are living in, in Marquette because they choose to be in this type of an environment where they have great education with the university, terrific health care with the hospital, uh, where they have recreation that is unparalleled, particularly in terms of skiing, mountain biking, running, all mm -hmm. of those types of things, and still have the ability to connect yeah. to whatever high technology business they're involved in. Yeah. You're making me want to come back when it's a little warmer. <laughs> um, well, we enjoy the shoulder season. Yeah. Historically, we've had some powerful foghorns in the New England coast that operated for thousands of hours in a year. But you had a, a series of fog signals at the Marquette Harbor Lighthouse. But there's a, really a very dirty story to that whole uh, fog business in the city and at the lighthouse. Obviously, we've always battled fog as, as we battle snow and squall and ice and everything, all of those environmental conditions. But... In, by the 1980s, the Coast Guard deemed the original fog signals no longer useful. Yeah. If they didn't need the useful signals, they saw no value in them. They obviously didn't need a house to keep them in. So the local chief of that time had the fog signals removed, taken out in a Coast Guard boat, dumped somewhere offshore within three miles of the point, and then walks into the fog signal building with two sticks of dynamite, lights the fuse, and literally blows at the smithereens not bothering to notify the local police or any of the local authorities who literally were rattled by, are we under attack, what's going on? When you add that to the fact that we have a, or had at the time, a, a strategic air command base mm -hmm. about 12 miles outside of town, of course, carrying nuclear weapons and nuclear tipped, that then began to really get rattly for the local authorities until they were able to straighten it out. The problem today is that we have a walkway then that goes all the way out to where the fog building used to be, and there's nothing there since the Coast Guard had so wantonly destroyed it. But this is not a good spot for a uh, vantage point for pictures of the lighthouse, at least? It serves that purpose? Well, it, it does serve that purpose, but unfortunately where the building was located is below the horizon a little bit from the predominant rocks, so you don't really see the lighthouse from there. Uh -huh. So one of the plans that we have long term is to try to rebuild that fog signal building. Oh. So at least we are creating the image of what once was mm -hmm. so people better understand that. With exhibits about on that subject? You know? That's what we would intend to do. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Again, I, I mentioned when I introduced you, you were a former mayor, you were a city commissioner, right, in Marquette. Why is it so important to you to do all that you do for the city of Marquette? Simple answer, I guess, for a big question, because I believe if everybody does not help push the wagon, you don't get anywhere. Mm -hmm. So we need people pushing that wagon. And whether you're an elected official or you're in what to a, a city appointed committee uh, or you're a member of any of our service clubs like Rotary and, and Kiwanis, et cetera, whether you're belonging to a private organization that is, again, perhaps activity focus, we have biking clubs, we have skiing clubs, et cetera. All of that helps make the community better in a thousand ways. And to get where you want to get, you've got to have everybody pushing behind that wagon. And that's why I want to be part of that push. Again, you've uh, been on the podcast before, and I want to uh, uh, talk to you again uh, more about your books and shipwrecks and so forth, maybe concentrate more on that. I'd love to do that at some point. But just uh, one thing about shipwrecks, but I believe your most popular book, and I, you've written a lot of books. I'm not sure what the number is, but. 
Uh, somewhere around 30 and a few more perhaps. Mm -hmm. You're ahead of me. I'm only uh, about 20. So. Well, I mean, I think we perhaps both made the decision that we weren't going to get them on quality. We're going to get them on quantity. <laughs> <laughs> so. Well, you're winning the race. <laughs> but no, I think you got the quality as well. So um, one of your, uh, I believe your most popular book is on the Edmund Fitzgerald, The Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald. Is that right. correct? Right. The, uh, the Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald has done, continues to do amazingly well. Uh, obviously, the Gordon Lightfoot song has a little to do with it. But why do you think people are so fascinated by the story of the Edmund Fitzgerald? I think everybody, to a point, has their own reason for being so interested in the wreck, but I think the one that perhaps resonates with a lot of people is the mystery of it. The, the use, in other words, it's a good ship and crew that sinks uh, in a terrific Lake Superior storm. The reason is still unknown, so you have that detective story that's kind of intertwined th throughout the, uh, the, the, the wreck. Uh, you also have the issue of the myth of Lake Superior and shipwrecks and the Edmund Fitzgerald almost coming to mean shipwrecks on all of the Great Lakes, just not the Fitzgerald. It's almost become the Titanic, if you will, of mm -hmm. the Great Lakes. It has also become this this legend, if mm -hmm. you will, yeah. of, of not only why it sunk, but what it came to mean to people in general and mariners in particular. Yeah. To the folks that are sailing the lakes today, and I mean the commercial guys, the Fitzgerald was yesterday. It is something they still know about, they think about. When we have a gale or storm come across the lakes, you'll see the ships laying in a lot easier, a lot sooner than they might have when they're in Fitzgerald. It's still there. It's still part of the, the environment of which we live in. Yeah. Well, it's not that long ago, 75, right? 1975. 1975, so it's coming up on the 50th in a few years. Yeah, so there's still plenty of people around who remember it. Well, yeah. And that's part of it. People remember that ship. They remember it. Let me phrase this a little differently. You and I are of the same age where we probably remember where we were when we heard John Kennedy was shot. Sure do. Well, for people on the Great Lakes, they know also where they were when they heard about the Fitzgerald. You go into any grade school in the Great Lakes area and you ask the kids for two shipwrecks and they will give you Titanic and they will give you the Edmund Fitzgerald. Yeah. Now, they may not know a lot about Fitzgerald, but the fact they can identify that name is, is dramatic. Mm -hmm. And if you spin that just a little bit further and you realize there's something like 535 books that were written about the Titanic by count, mm -hmm. by Google count, okay. and there are in contrast to that somewhere around a dozen that have been done on the Fitzgerald. 45 folk, uh, featured movies done on Titanic and zero on the Fitzgerald. You could have changed that. Well, there's been opportunities made and the, the book at one point was actually under contract to a, a production studio out of Hollywood and they chose not to pick it up. Mm -hmm. uh, which is okay. I mean, it's a tough story to tell for right. most of the country. We're in flyover country. People don't know about the Great Lakes. They don't know about who we are and what we do in comparison to the Atlantic seaboard or, of course, the, the, the western uh, coast. Yeah. So last week we had um, six or eight boats that were... Uh, six. Six, six boats seven. in... Seven boats. Okay, seven boats that were in Marquette Harbor because there were gale force winds mm -hmm. and things were backed up at the Sioux. So there were all these ore boats kind of sitting and every there were people lined up taking photographs. It was pretty amazing. Yeah. And one of the boats was the Arthur Anderson, which you know they've since redone. And I was driving with my 15-year-old daughter and I said something about, oh, the Arthur Anderson's out there. And she's like, the Arthur Anderson? And she actually knew what it was that I was talking about. Yeah. She said, oh, from the Edmund Fitzgerald? She knew exactly who the Arthur Anderson was. So Her daughter is how old? She's 15. Uh -huh. Yeah, so I thought that was great. I, that you know, is great. When I was 15, I didn't know that kind of stuff. <laughs> I think it still holds up because those warships are still out there. They're the same look and age as the Fitzgerald. So it's not history that's gone away. It's still active here. And so I think when they go to the Sioux Locks and stuff, they're, they're being able to understand what these ships look like in real life. It's mm -hmm. not they're learning through a history book. Yeah. And so I think then they're like, so that ship actually sunk out there and they don't know why. And so I think that just, like with lighthouses, it spurs the curiosity to seek them out. Oh, and there. the song helped. I think, you know, lighthouses are often seen as kind of a window into history for an area, and, and shipwrecks, uh, I think, do that uh, as well. 
It's the maritime history of the United States, of the station and arguably the world. Yeah. Because all these things, whether it's lighthouses, life savings, shipwrecks, shipping today, all of that ties together into this wonderful fabric that, uh, that I think we just get so interested in. Yeah. Marquette Harbor Lighthouse was one of uh, several that were tied together with a radio telephone system in 1932. What, what, what was that all about? Well, it was during that period of time the Coast Guard was uh, beginning heavily to use technology in terms of management of lighthouses and other maritime uh, opportunities. And they were linking together, to the extent they could, efficiently, effectively, and cheaply, not only the lighthouses, but also Coast Guard stations, Coast Guard small boat stations. Mm -hmm. So next to Marquette Harbor Lighthouse are a number of concrete tower bases. And those were where the original towers were constructed, not only for the broadcast areas for AM voice, but also for the radio direction finding transmission and reception that the lighthouses uses. Right. Uh, you mentioned earlier uh, Standard Rock. Uh, Standard was in the voice communication on a periodic schedule with Station Marquette. And that, again, AM voice, so 2182, I think, kilocycles was what they were using. So it was part of a, a Great Lakes-wide system and by extension throughout the service use. Yeah, okay. Well, we mentioned the, the Coast Guard a, a couple of times, uh, but I haven't got much into it, but the Coast Guard had a big presence right around here where we are. The Life Saving Station arrived in Marquette in 1891. Okay. And that, at the time, was one of just a very few stations on Lake Superior and a comparatively few stations on the Great Lakes. We would end up on the Great Lakes with 61 of them. And, of course, Marquette Station was a key station in that, a chain of rescue, and it remained a life-saving station until the U.S. Life-Saving Service and Revenue Marine Service combined to form the Coast Guard in 1915. Mm -hmm. And throughout that period of time, it did perform a series of very dramatic rescues uh, that are legendary today, and we certainly celebrate within the Maritime Museum because we're talking about courage. And today we often lose sight of what courage really is and how it can be applied in different ways. We think of it as being military courage, going out and fighting a war and fighting a battle. But there's also that special courage that a, a lifesaver had to have, knowing when he was doing the particular drills and the small boats and the breaches buoy and related, that he was going to have to do those same activities in the teeth of the worst storms that the Great Lakes or the Atlantic Ocean or the Pacific Ocean could throw at him. Yeah. that he was required by regulation, by his oath, to put his life in danger to save the lives of others. And I think that's something that we, we really need to remember, we really need to celebrate yeah. and honor. I totally agree. The life-saving service is incredible. Of course, the, and the motto, you, know, you have to go out, but you don't have to come back. They never knew if there were... And these are folks that live them. Yeah, yeah. Oh, the courage is unbelievable. And the Coast Guard uh, search and rescue people today, same thing. Same thing. Yeah. Uh, that's a, a tradition that they live by also. So I'd like to bring Kurt into the conversation. Uh, Kurt, there was a fourth order for now lens in Marquette Harbor Lighthouse. Uh, do we know where that is now? I have a strong hunch. Everything I've done research, I think the Marquette original fourth order lens is down, last I heard in storage, at the Dawson Marine Museum in Detroit. That's all my research got it to there. It left Marquette. I don't remember what year. I'm not good like Fred is with the dates and stuff. I ain't remember all that. But it went up to Sand Hill Lighthouse oh. up in the Keweenaw just briefly. I don't even know if it was a season. And then they decommissioned that lighthouse, and it went down and ended up at that museum. And I only got so far tracking it, and somebody said, oh, that's, I think, in the basement or something. So that's as far as I've gotten. Mm -hmm. But I think it exists. I think it's still around. Okay, it'd be pretty cool to get it back. Yes, it'd be awesome. And speaking of lenses here in the museum, in the Marquette Maritime Museum, right next to us where we're sitting here is the second order, fantastic, spectacular, uh, rotating second order Fresnel lens from Standard Rock Lighthouse, the lighthouse that's farthest offshore of any lighthouse in the country. Uh, I imagine you've uh, spent a little time with this lens. You probably know it pretty well. Well, the ironic part is that's how I got started as a professional lampist. Ah. Uh, I was a board member here, board of directors at the Maritime Museum. Essentially, we got the lens on loan, and it came with a gentleman to put it up. Mm -hmm. Mr. Jim Woodward from the United States Coast Guard came to a, assemble the lens, and I volunteered that day. Well, him and I kind of hit it off, kind of had this Vulcan mind meld going, and then he asked me to 
apprentice for him after that. Mm -hmm. So not only is this lens in our museum our first lens, well, second lens we got here, but it was the first one I ever worked on, and 22 years later, I'm still working on them. So it did open up big doors for me. It sure did. You're certainly one of the most respected lampus in the country. Thank you. One of a, a rare breed. <laughs> How many how many qualified lampus are there in the country? Well, technically, there's five, is what this rumor always was, and then there was a. But most of the other gentlemen are retired now, is my understanding. Joe Cocking being one of those. Correct. I haven't spoken to any of the other lampus in a long time. We just kind of all went our separate ways. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you're just a kid compared to to some of them. Correct. And um, I'm still busy. I'm still working full time doing this now. So that's fantastic. What what jobs are you? You mentioned one to me earlier, California Pigeon Point, right? Uh, Pigeon Point. That's, well, that's going to go back up. in the tower in a year or two, maybe a year and a half. We've got some big projects for the National Park Service that are still can't quite be discussed, mm -hmm. um, but they're in the in the works. Pigeon Point's the big one. We've got some hotels. There's a couple of hotels going up that want a lens on top of them. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. It's very an interesting thing. It's still in the works, but... Interesting. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> and then a lot of little stuff. Since I am one of the only ones still actively working on a regular basis, I'm doing a lot of cleanings and movings and things of that nature. Uh, Nick and I were at the uh, Lake Superior Maritime Visitor Center. Is that the name of it? <laughs> in, Lake Superior. In Duluth. Yeah. Corps of Engineers building, yeah. Yeah, yeah. A lot of it's related to the Corps of Engineers, yeah. but there was a really nice Fresnel lens in display in there, actually. I believe, three, three Three lenses, yeah. yeah. Uh, you had a hand on that, I would imagine? The two that are by themselves in the case at the very bottom of the ramp, I removed both of them for the Coast Guard. One of my jobs that I do is I go for the Coast Guard as a subcontractor and remove lenses from the towers, they come right behind me and put up their modern aid to navigation. And then I take the lens off to whatever historical society yeah. has got possession of it next. So those are both the North and South entry lights in Duluth. They just came right off the breakwaters. Yeah, right. I took them right around on a cart and put them right in the building and restored them in the basement and then put them on pedestals. So yeah. it's a nice um, display. They got red and green lights in them. Correct. Yes. Yeah. And the fifth order rotating lens across from. Yeah, I'm not that familiar with that. I mean, I've seen it. I mm -hmm. know of it, but I don't remember where that's from. From the inner light? It's one from one of the breakwater light. light. Yeah, I, would say I, was, I was impressed by that place. Well, one of the things that I do that nobody else does is I have a machine shop for making reproduction components for the lamps and the lenses and the clockworks and things right. of that yeah. material. So I'll go to a site and do an assessment on a lens or a clockworks, and then I'll make parts list and I'll manufacture parts and either ship them out or go out and restore yep. them. Yeah. Well, that's kind of what's going on with Pigeon Point. That clockworks hasn't worked in 50, 60 years and now they want it to run again. So, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because I know that's a specialty of yours too, is uh, making uh, pedestals and uh, related uh, equipment. The odd parts. <laughs> yeah. One of the, uh, the gigs you had along that line was working on the movie, The Lighthouse. Correct. Where Dan Spinella of Artworks of Florida created the actual third order Fresnel lens yes. in the movie, but a lot of the, the the stuff around the lens and in the lighthouse and everything. you, you I made everything below the lens mm -hmm. to the floor. Uh -huh. um, the, all the clockworks, the cabinetry, the rotation, everything, I manufactured that at home Yeah, on a budget with no time and, <laughs> and drove it, was, it all the way out to Halifax, Nova Scotia in a U-Haul uh -huh. truck with no cruise control. It was absolutely <laughs> incredible. The detail, and I just love the detail in that movie. I love the whole look of it. I know some people, there's some disagreement about the the, the content of the movie. I personally liked it. I uh, love the movie. Yeah, I did yes. too. But, uh, the, the detail, no matter what people think about the other aspects of it, the detail was incredible. Well, their set designer, uh, he was supposed to be infamous for detail and things mm -hmm. of that. The foghorn that's shown in that movie was an actual functioning real foghorn that a gentleman brought over, uh -huh. set up, put under steam power, and used for the fog signal. I loved, you know, Robert Pattinson shoveling the coal yeah. for the boiler and all that. You never yeah. saw that in a movie before. Right. Yeah. The, the dirty part, the aspects, the moving a hole in the oil up to the top, mm -hmm. even though he took the wrong cans. Yeah. <laughs> you, would, you would know if there was some detail that wasn't quite right. Well, that's part of the movie. Oh, He's was... hauling those heavy, heavy oh, cans, okay. didn't right. realize that there's a small, oh, a that's small right. that quart can that he movie. could have taken up. Yeah. instead of the, right, the large one. Yeah, yeah. So we could, again, I hope maybe we can talk at more length about uh, some of this uh, stuff at some point in the future. But to shift gears a bit, could you tell me uh, a little bit about the the museum? First of all, is this museum year-round or not? 
the museum and lighthouse tours are seasonal. We mm-hmm. run from mid-May to mid-October. Yeah. And um, we are open every day of the week but Mondays. And we usually have uh, three guided lighthouse tours a day. Mm-hmm. Um, and those are run by volunteers. And then the museum is self-guided. Mm-hmm. So this coming season, you'll be starting in, let's see, what is this? We're getting towards the end of April, yeah. so it's not too far May away. May 17th. Yeah. It's our opening day. Opening day. And lighthouse tours will be will be happening as, as well as the museum uh, yes. being open. Let me ask you, uh, you have uh, various other optics and uh, fog signals. We talked about some other things, but is there anything I'm, I'm missing here relating to uh, lighthouse history that people might, people who are lighthouse buffs listening would be especially Well, I think interested. a big thing, that we've got the only lens that probably has a criminal past. What Fred's referring to is the Huron Island Lighthouse, uh, what's left of the three and a half order lens. Um, it's kind of a fascinating story in the 72 or 73, the lens was stolen from the Huron Island Lighthouse. Um, quite often, as much as the Coast Guard doesn't like to admit it, there was the option of gravity decommissioning where a lens was taken out of the tower and smashed for the brass for the war effort usually. So this lens ended up disappearing and that was the end of the story. Mm-hmm. And we get a call, oh boy, I bet you it's been 10 years ago now, <laughs> Down in northern Wisconsin, they had arrested this gentleman on child pornography charges and raided his house, and there's pieces of a Fresnel lens sitting in his coffee table. Well, that had a double effect on that gentleman because that became federal property, and now it became a federal case instead of a local case. So it was no longer a misdemeanor or whatever. It was a felony Hmm. because he is in possession of aid and navigation, parts of it. So... They sent a federal agent from Washington, D.C. to go seize what was left. And all it was was a, the top upper catadioptric section of the lens with just a couple pieces of prism hanging out of it. And it was all beaten up. And it was kind of blackened and everything. Mm-hmm. And they had the gentleman in custody. And they asked. It was an enthusiastic Coast Guard investigation. So I, I spoke to the gentleman and I said, I'm here. I've driven a long ways today and the weather was really crappy. And I'd like to know if there's any more of this lens because I'm taking it back to the Coast Guard. And sure enough, he said out at his home, which is a mobile home out in the middle of the woods in northern Wisconsin, he had buried it underneath the fire pit, the remains of the lens, so he wouldn't get in any trouble. Wow. And then he, when he thought he might get caught, he dug it up and he put it in a barrel in an outhouse, a plastic barrel in an outhouse. So... In the middle of this ice storm, this federal agent and I jump into a truck and we drive out there and we he kicked the door open on this guy's place and sure enough in the bathroom was the remaining prisms to the upper catheter optics of the lens and a couple of small diopteric pieces. Mm. Well, I boxed them all up and wrapped them in the newspaper and was putting them in my Jeep and all of a sudden a guy comes barreling over the hill in a pickup truck and he's supposed to be guarding this guy's home while he's in jail and he's got a firearm Mm -hmm. and he's waving it around and we had a whole armed standoff with this gentleman and I got to go barreling out of town with this lens, remains of this lens in the back of my truck and radioed ahead. I got to go through the stoplights and the stop signs until I got back onto 95 (sighs) to get out of the way of this armed standoff they were having. All over what you see, the remains of this lens. (laughs) And I brought it back home and re did the top, the upper catadaptrics. And that's all we have left. He had sold the frame in the builder's plate and everything for beer money. Oh, so. That's quite a story. When are you going to write your, a book on your uh, your life as a lampist, with that <laughs> being uh, probably the most uh, spectacular chapter? Well, there have been some odd stories working as a lampist. Uh-huh. I'm sure. Or maybe a, a Netflix series. On a yeah. Trip. Actually, we were approached once by a group that wanted to do some kind of a lens stories, weekly lens stories, and nothing ever came of it. Hmm. I think it should be like a true crime uh, series on Netflix. (laughs) So, uh, again, I want to shift uh, gears a little bit. I'm just uh, wondering to clarify for me and for listeners about the management of the museum and the lighthouse. The Marquette Maritime Museum is a 501c3 nonprofit, Mm -hmm. and the Marquette Harbor Lighthouse is owned by the city of Marquette. So we have an agreement with the city of Marquette to do interpretive tours of Mm -hmm. the lighthouse. Mm -hmm. So that's how we handle that with them. And this, the property that this is all on is a seven acre park um, called Lighthouse Park. 
which mm-hmm. is owned by the city. So we just we work with the city as what as much as we can to you know do what we have to do to make sure our interpretive tours are ready to go. As far as uh, raising money to work, do uh, restoration work on the lighthouse, that kind of thing. Is it the 501c3 that does that, or is there a, is there another is there a friends group or anything? Like that? Well, we it's not our lighthouse, so um, we uh, anything that that would get done to the lighthouse at this point on would be through the city. Yeah. But what we do right now as part of the agreement is when we sell admission tickets for tours, half of the money goes to the lighthouse that goes into a fund okay. that they use for restoration. We're going to open up the tower for, for tours this summer. And so the money that we're using to pay the painter to fix and do some things up there is coming from that fund that mm-hmm. uh, that they've started with half of the proceeds from the ticket sales. Okay. Is there any work planned uh, like really soon before the lighthouse opens for the season or what's... Well, the problem with getting it painted before we open for the season is that the weather. Yeah. I mean, we he's, he's going to do some work on the windows and it just needs to be a lot warmer. So it might not, this is Marquette, it might not happen before, yeah. you know, May 17th. Yeah. It might be the middle of the right. summer, but th- it'll happen this summer. And if it's damp, you don't want to do a lot of painting. Or... Right, yeah, but it, it'll happen this summer. We're just not quite sure when. Yeah. You, you just have to be patient. Is there anything business. else in the pipeline as far as restoration? You know, we, we talk frequently with the city. Um, they have some other things. COVID kind of pushed a lot of things back, such as Um, They have some plans for the park. The captain's quarters um, for the Coast Guard, they're actually turning that into a short-term rental. And with that, they'll uh, make a little bit of revenue for the city. So that got pushed back because of COVID. And so now they're trying to get that ready for this summer. And then slowly things will mm-hmm. you know start happening a little bit quicker quicker i think yeah saw that i saw that it looks like a nice house and is that going to be like weekly rentals yes yeah yeah well, that'll be nice yeah. get, that'll fill up it, yeah it will it'll be very popular there's something i have to ask it came up when you were just uh, showing me around inside the lighthouse when you were uh downstairs in the in the building in the bottom floor uh an interesting discussion came up and i have to ask you about this uh is the lighthouse haunted Hillary, maybe well, I will that. answer that one. So we have one of our tour guides who is now a board member. Um, when she first started off as a tour guide, she started having like just little weird things happening to her while she was in the lighthouse. And she became convinced that something was going on that was not you know, of this world, I guess mm-hmm. you can say. So she organized um, a paranormal investigation team out of Nagani named Uper Paranormal to come and do an investigation. And they've done a couple and they got all kinds of little clips and all kinds of things happening there. I guess because the lighthouse is surrounded by water and it's also on rock, that's supposed to be like, I mean, it's like the perfect storm, I guess, for for that kind of paranormal activity. So what's been happening for the last couple years is our our um, volunteer and board member Susan Hill and Uper Paranormal have been doing investigations once a week, and they've been uh, selling tickets and then doing it as a fundraiser mm-hmm. for the museum. And then you can also do these are just kind of uh, shorter tours, and they could they were also doing um, a longer actual investigation where you could be there for four or five hours, where they were charging a little bit more. So it turned out to be a really good fundraiser for us, especially during COVID, because it was just a small group of people. Um, but they found some stuff. I mean, they they just did. We have a winter lecture series called Maritime History on Tap that we do at one of the local brew pubs. And the very last one we had of the season was April 12th. And so Susan and one of the women from Upper Paranormal did an, uh, a program on things that they had found. They had videos and audio and mm-hmm. all kinds of things. And we've had people calling since then asking about when our paranormal tours are going to start so it's popular it's a great way for us to make money and i would say yes there's something going on up there i mean yeah. i don't have a lot to do with that um but yes we have people that definitely think there's something going on up at that lighthouse people who know me know i have an open mind on these things so i certainly don't don't disbelieve and i i agree with you that it's a uh, it's a good way to raise money it's also a, like we were talking about uh, lighthouses and shipwrecks being a window into the history of an area the, the, attracting people with the ghost tours it's a way of opening a window and getting them interested in the, the history of the lighthouse and the maritime history right. nick you wanted to add something yeah so I, I i took i think it was maybe a year and a half ago or something susan was doing one of those and it was a windy windy night out there in the point and uh i had one of those meters that you know the lights light up that you know from 
green to the red. EMF. The electromagnetic yeah. finder, yeah. And I yeah. walked through that place, and it would just be solid red the whole time. You know, it would be like no lights would light up, and then it was just solid as yeah. you walked through it. Yeah. Yeah, and, uh, you know, it's you know, it's an eerie place. You know, it's, it's yeah. a building that's been kind of abandoned for so many years, and mm-hmm. you hear the wind rustling through, and... But I'd say you won't be disappointed when you go out there. Like you, yeah. they capture something every time. It's not just a, yeah. a quite empty building. Mm-hmm. So, and Nick, at some point, we should probably just do a podcast on this on this subject because you've yeah. got some stories about the lighthouses you've owned. But we won't get into that yeah. right now. <laughs> That's another story, and I have experiences too that I've talked about on the well, podcast before. One, one other thing I'd like to include is I, I hired Kurt uh, to move the third order lens from the museum here back to Big Bay, and. Uh, you know, this is not advertising or anything, but he was the funnest person to work with because he empowers you to take control over that lens. And so he was dismantling it and he's, you know, like, you know, put on your, your boots and help me get this thing taken apart. But he took all the screws and put them into his little pocket there. And we were putting the lens back and he was just pulling a screw out. And he's like, nope, this isn't the one. But it was just random panels. I was like, they all look the same. And he knew just... Mm-hmm. Nope, this doesn't fit here. That's the screw that's a little jiggly on that hole. And I was like, how does he remember this type of stuff? But yeah. it was an eight-hour process, and it, it was fun. I have pictures of it. And I'm not saying you move lenses for fun, like and if you own a Fresnel lens, but I'm saying yeah, he did a great job. Thank you. Okay, I have two final questions for bonus points. Okay, so you can uh, any one of you can grab the, the mic here and answer these last couple of questions, or all of you are certainly welcome to. But for one, uh, Marquette Harbor Lighthouse has been called the oldest historically significant building in the city of Marquette. Why is it so significant, and why does it need to be preserved? The city of Marquette literally burned to the ground in 1868. So most of the Oidoc structure was gone, almost all of the downtown was gone, and a considerable part of the residential area was gone. So therefore, there wasn't much left when we built the lighthouse in 1866, located way out on a spigot of rock where it was safe from the flames. So when we began to rebuild, you were all post-1868, and the lighthouse was by definition, therefore, the oldest building in town. Mm -hmm. And it still is uh, from the standpoint that the only other structure that would rival it is a small stone cabin called the Burt House, in South Marquette, which is an 1854 structure, I think, Mm -hmm. and has no particular relevance in terms of being interpreted or being really part of the the key part of the community. But when you balance the the terrific job that that red lighthouse did, uh, yellow at the time, in terms of the development of this nation, the development of the iron ore industry on the upper Great Lakes, and understanding as background that, that the great fields in Minnesota did not really develop until well into the late 1880s, 1890s, 1900s, with uh, with the predominance of the shipping still coming out of Marquette. And you consider the role that the iron ore played during World War One and World War Two. again, massive amounts moving out of the city. This is easily the most historically significant building we have and has become certainly an icon of the city of Marquette. When you talk to folks that have been tourists here and they've come back, They will tell you two things they remember about Marquette, the Red Lighthouse and the Iron Ore Dock. Mm -hmm. And those are the two features. Extremely well said. I don't know, uh, Hillary or or Kurt, if uh, if you want to try to top that. No, (laughs) no, that's what I would have said. I took it right out of her mouth. Okay. So final question. Again, this is for any or all, all of you. What has been your favorite thing about your association with, let's say, both uh, either or the Market Maritime Museum and the Lighthouse? I've been on the board of directors since just after they opened up in here in the building. And I'd say my favorite part, personally my favorite part of it here, besides working with the community and protecting the history, because I'm into history, I'm in all kinds of history, in the maritime history and anything, but my, my favorite part was meeting Fred. Fred Stonehouse was one of the first people I met in town, and we became buddies 35, 36 years ago. Oh, my God, maybe even more than that. And uh, Fred's got me onto the board and got me interested in the maritime history and the shipping and, and just being part of the community where we can interpret this and show the public. Um, one of the things that we've always found here at the Maritime Museum is that the locals almost never come in here. They didn't know about, we didn't know there was a Maritime Museum here. Maritime Museum's been here almost 40 years and 
and oh, we've never done that. You didn't. They didn't know that. So it's it's fun to get the word out. Uh, Hillary does a wonderful job with advertising. TV six has always been good to us to get the word out. Yeah. Because as Fred mentioned, uh, the shipping to this area, shipping the iron ore out of this area, bringing people in here and goods in here and building this community was very important. Mm-hmm. And I love being on the board where we can help interpret this and show it and display this and uh, and, and get that information out to the public. Yeah. And educate them. It's the things they don't even know are in their own backyard. Uh, tell them why the stuff here, why the red building is up on the hill. Mm-hmm. Things of that nature. It's a it's a wonderful community and it's a wonderful museum. We have a beautiful museum and Hillary does an amazing job. She's the best director we could ever imagine. It really helps. Anything you want to respond to there, Hillary? One thing that that I would like to say is the director of the museum is that people automatically think of the lighthouse. And to me, I'm like, well, this museum is also mm-hmm. a wonderful trove of history. And so I feel like my job has been really pushing the museum part and just trying to improve it over the years. Mm-hmm. And uh, I just, you know, I love having the field trips come in. The kids get excited when they walk around the corner and see that lens and we can yeah. just talk about the lens. But it's such a wonderful city full of so many stories. And I like being a part of uh, preserving that. I was thinking how... I don't know if it's totally unique, but unusual to have a, a maritime museum kind of next door to a, a lighthouse that work uh, hand in hand so, so yeah, nicely. It's, yeah, it's a great opportunity. Yeah, mm-hmm. definitely. Fred, anything you want to add? I was a founding board member of the Maritime Museum back in the late 1970s. And it was only a few years prior that this particular building was abandoned by the city of Marquette. It had been a functioning waterworks. And this is literally, at the time, a, the pump station, the pump building. Okay. And the city had just completed the building that's now next to us. And if you uh, take a good look at the two, you'll see the architecture blends very nicely, that it almost looks like the same building. And that was very deliberately done by the city of Marquette, that they did not want to build an industrial building. They wanted something that had a little bit of style to it. They were able to do that, but that meant this building was then available. So the association was able to lease it from the city on a 99-year lease for a dollar. And then everything kind of has built over time and, and used this as the foundation for not acquiring the lighthouse in total, but at least having the legal uh, agreement we do with the city of Marquette to operate it now with the fullest of understanding that it was the Maritime Museum that saved that lighthouse from literally crumbling by getting the roof put on it and taking other actions in terms of the structure of the building. But what we've developed into today is, I think, very unique because with the movement of the Coast Guard station from the old 1891 building to the new building in, the, in 2010, that's the one located just to the, to the east of us, and the acquisition by the city of Marquette of the seven or so acres that the Coast Guard had previously occupied with the structures on the property, including the lighthouse, the keeper's quarters, and the, uh, the boathouse. The garage-like building you see to the north of us is not actually a garage originally, but was the boathouse for Stannis Rock and was moved from the waterfront inland, reconfigured into a garage. And that now has been acquired by the Maritime Museum as a lease agreement, too, from the city. And we're making that into a small performance area that will be focusing also on the uh, recreational use of the market waterfront. But what that gives us then, along with some large pieces of lawn art, uh, for example, you've seen a big ice buoy that's outside and on located. We've got a lifeboat we haven't located yet. Uh, we've got a couple of Coast Guard boats, a 40 and a, 30, and a 36 boat, yet to do some restoration work on us and positioning. So there's things to move around the chessboard. Yeah. But it has given us a campus. So while the bulk of the property is city park and publicly accessible, some of the key pieces of it are part of the Maritime Museum in terms of ownership, operation, and security. So it's a wonderful opportunity and a wonderful uh, capability, I think, of working together with the local government as, as a 501c3 to bring the very best we can in terms of maritime history, not only locally, but also as it affects all of the Great Lakes to people's attention. And that's been very successful. I would say so. This is just so much, so much fun. Hillary Billman and Kurt Fosberg and Fred Stonehouse and Nick Gorstead. Uh, this is uh, is just a, a real, real treat to be here. And I'm having a great time, and I want to thank you so much for uh, joining me today.
You can learn more about the Marquette Maritime Museum at mqtmaritimemuseum.com. The site includes an online gift shop where you can buy some of Frederick Stonehouse's books and souvenirs related to the lighthouses. Many thanks again to Hillary, Fred, and Kurt for being such generous hosts at the Maritime Museum and Lighthouse. It was a really fun day there. Thanks also to all the members, volunteers, and staff of the U.S. Lighthouse Society. Check out uslhs.org to learn more about the tours, the passport program, preservation grants, and everything the Society offers. Donations and memberships help to support this podcast. If you listen to the podcast using Apple Podcasts or any platform that allows you to post reviews, please rate and review us. The German-Dutch diarist Anne Frank was born on June 12, 1929. She once wrote, quote, As long as this exists, this sunshine and this cloudless sky, and as long as I can enjoy it, how can I be sad, unquote. Next week's episode of Lighthearted will feature two more interviews recorded on my recent trip to Michigan, Craig Wilson at Old Mackinac Point and Karen Hintz at Eagle Harbor. And there will be a special edition episode posted this Wednesday featuring researcher B.J. Weir in a discussion of Sailor's Snug Harbor on Staten Island, New York, a really interesting subject. As always, to all our regular listeners and to our new ones, thanks so much for listening and keep a good light.